All right, why don't we go ahead and uh, get started. So uh, the last lecture we talked a little bit about T cells and what they're recognizing, uh, how they get activated and so forth. And that's, uh, you know, we talked about the fact that these cells are primarily out in these peripheral uh, lymphoid tissues. And today we're going to be talking about specifically um, to sort of finish up our, our discussion about this T cell activation. And in particular, how T cells not simply get that, that signal to become activated, but also what's actually happening within the cell and how that involves the production of this cytokine called interleukin-2 or IL-2. And then we'll also talk again about tolerance and we'll come back to this issue of how uh, co-stimulation is involved in promoting tolerance of T cells. And then we'll spend most of our time today talking about what we call effector cells. These are T cells that have been stimulated productively by an antigen presenting cell. Um, and so they convert from their naive state into their activated state. They start to divide, so they start to undergo clonal expansion. And then on top of that, they also start to differentiate into unique effector subsets. And it's these effector cells that do the job of, uh, for example, as a helper cell, they can uh, differentiate into what we call Th1 and Th2 cells, as well as, well as uh, regulatory T cells we've talked about before. Uh, we'll also talk about cytokine signaling and how that really is involved in the, um, not only the generation of these different um, helper cell subsets, but also their effector function. And then we'll talk about cyto cytotoxicity and how cytotoxic T cells, the CD8 positive T cells, do their job in getting rid of um, viral infection and so forth. And then if we have some time towards the end, we'll talk about, uh, we'll return to this issue that you guys have heard before about this collaboration that exists between T cells and B cells and how T cells um, can help B cells so that they can generate high affinity antibodies. All right, and then I just wanted to pause for a second and again point out that, um, you know, feel free to use the message board if you have any questions. I also have office hours today at two o'clock, so, you know, show up. I, I had one person last week and, you know, it's, there's always, there's room for more. I have two chairs in my office, so at least two of you guys can show up. So, uh, so do take advantage of that time. And if you can't take advantage of that time, either use the message board or send me an email and we can set up a time to meet. I'm uh, ho hopefully approachable. So, you know, if you guys have any questions or, or concerns or anything like that, feel free to, to come by and we can, we can talk about that. All right, so I'm gonna talk about T cell activation and, um, and in particular, you know, we've talked about this idea that there are certain thresholds for T cell activation that are really dictated by this interaction between the, the T cell receptor itself and peptide plus MHC. And, and we were really talking about that in the context of T cell uh, development, you know, negative selection and positive selection. And now I really want to talk about this in the context of, of what's happening inside the cell. And so for that, I'm going to use, again, my lecturer's prerogative and show a, a nice YouTube video. The T cell receptor is a complex of antigen-specific alpha and beta chains associated in the membrane with the CD3, gamma, delta, epsilon, and zeta chains. Each of the CD3 chains has at least one copy of a signaling motif, the immunoreceptor tyrosine-based activation motif, or ITAM, in its cytoplasmic domain. Various Sark family tyrosine kinases associate with the cytoplasmic domains of the T cell receptor complex. Thin, along with other Sark kinase family members, such as LCK, are important for T-cell activation. Other molecules involved in T-cell activation include CD45, whose cytoplasmic domain contains a tyrosine phosphatase enzyme, and the T-cell co-receptor, either CD4 or CD8. In this example, the co-receptor is CD4. The co-receptor molecules have bound to their cytoplasmic domains the tyrosine kinase LCK. The cytosolic enzyme ZAP70 also plays an essential role in T-cell activation. As this is a CD4 T-cell, its antigen receptor recognizes an NHC class II molecule together with its bound peptide. When the T-cell receptor binds its specific NHC peptide complex, a number of events take place within the cell. First, intracellular Sark family tyrosine kinase enzymes, such as FIN, are activated by CD45 which removes inhibitory phosphate groups from the enzymes. The activated FIN kinase then phosphorylates the ITAMs of the T-cell receptor CD3 components. The phosphorylated ITAMs are binding sites for a second kinase, ZAP70, which can now bind to the phosphorylated zeta chain. 
The co-receptor, in this example CD4, is also able to bind to the same NHC peptide complex as the T-cell antigen receptor. This binding brings the co-receptor-associated tyrosine kinase LCK into close proximity to ZAP70, and as a result, LCK phosphorylates and thus activates ZAP70. The activated ZAP70 can now bind to and activate a number of intracellular signaling adapter proteins, for example LAT, which in turn are able to activate other signaling pathways within the cell. In this video, we... we yeah, that's a cool video. We'll come back to that. You can see a T cell that becomes at. All right. <laughs> okay, so basically what that showed is the process of T cell activation, what's actually happening downstream of the T cell receptor. And, and one of the things to note, I mean, I think that that's a nice movie and it, and it shows sort of schematically what's happening to a T cell, but one of the things to keep in mind is that this is not happening with a single receptor on the surface of this T cell interacting with a single MHC peptide molecule. There's a whole array of these, and it's typical you know, that you may have thousands of these interactions that are taking place. And we know that it requires roughly about 100 uh, interactions between peptide MHC and a T cell receptor in order for that T cell to overcome that threshold for activation. So it needs to have quite a bit of signaling going on inside of the cell to, to get it to, um, to start to proliferate, start to differentiate. So, so let's go through this. So basically here we're showing a, a schematic of an antigen presenting cell and in this case um, we're not showing the B7 on the surface of this but we'll get back to that uh, in a minute. So, so here we have MHC class 2, it's presenting a peptide within this, um, this MHC molecule and that then, you know, T cell comes along in this case, it's a CD4 helper T cell, and in this case, it's naive, so it's never seen antigen before. And so the result of this interaction is that CD4 can then come along and bind to an invariant portion of, of MHC class two. We talked about this before when we were talking about selection, positive selection, that it's not just the T cell receptor itself that's, that's binding and driving the signal in, inside the cell. You also need to have either CD4 or CD8, which we, we call a co-receptor, that needs to bind to MHC, and that actually results in a, a unique signal inside of this T cell that allows it to become activated. And so the result of that interaction is that you have, uh, on the inside of the cell, you have a molecule called LCK associated with CD4, and when CD4 is brought into this complex associating with, with MHC class two, the result is that that activates LCK. So LCK can then go on and uh, of course at this point you've also got binding of the T cell receptor itself to MHC plus peptide. And so those two interactions then allow LCK to start to phosphorylate these molecules that are associated with the T cell receptor. And these are called CD3 molecules. And so there are CD3, gamma, uh, delta, and zeta that are basically present within the cell and it's important to note that the, the T cell receptor itself is completely devoid of any sort of enzymatic activity. So it alone cannot send a signal inside of the cell. It needs to make these, these associations with these CD3 molecules. So once LCK is activated, it starts to phosphorylate these CD3 chains that are here uh, inside the cytosol. And so, uh, and, and I should say that that phosphorylation is taking place in the context of motifs that are called ITAMs. These ITAMs, that stands for immunotyrosine, immunoreceptor tyrosine-based activation motif. And those are basically sites where there are tyrosines that can then become phosphorylated by these tyrosine kinases, such as LCK. So the consequence of that is that you get this phosphorylation of, of these ITAM residues, and that brings in a second tyrosine kinase that's called ZAP70. So as a consequence of LCK activity, phosphorylation of those CD3 chains, you then get the recruitment and activation of, of another tyrosine kinase called ZAP70. So ZAP70 then um, becomes activated in this context and it starts to phosphorylate additional uh, chains within this complex, as well as some adapters that we won't go into, but the result of all of that is that you get a change in the activity of a variety of different signaling pathways in the cell that ultimately uh, alter global gene transcription inside of the cell. So in, this, in its naive state, all these pathways are inactive, but once the T cell receptor is bound, you, you have CD4 bound um, to MHC. The result of the, that complex is that 
those signaling pathways are activated and then the result is that they ultimately impinge on special transcription factors that then promote T cell uh, clonal expansion and differentiation. And those transcription factors are called NFAT, NF-kappa B, and, and AP1. And we won't go into any detail in this course about how that process uh, takes place other than to say that those transcription factors, we know they're all very important because if you eliminate them, either through genetic knockout or blocking the, the signaling pathways that activate them, the result is that the T cells don't get activated. And can you think of any reason why you wouldn't want a T cell to get activated? Yeah. Uh, transplants. transplants, sure. So we'll, we'll have a lecture where we talk about transplants and we'll actually talk about some of the drugs that are used to prevent T cell activation. In fact, one of those blocks the activation of this molecule called NFAT. And the result of that is that, you know, if you get a transplant, that transplant's not going to get rejected. Okay, so by, by blocking the T cells. Any, any other thoughts about why you might want to block a T cell response? Yeah. Sure, so an autoimmune situation would be a similar place where you wouldn't want to have somebody, you know, having an autoimmune reaction and then rejecting, you know, or, or causing uh, damage to some tissue inside. So, you know, there's a lot of effort on the part of, of scientists and drug companies to try to identify these, these pathways. Um, and, and of course, a lot of this work has been done, you know, in the past, and there's still a lot of effort going on right now to really understand these in more detail. And the reason for that is that, you know, what's the downside of blocking T cell activation? So let's say, that, you know, you, you have a patient that comes in. How many of you, by the way, are, are planning on going to medical school after it's a reasonable, reasonable number. What about uh, graduate school? Okay, another reasonable number, good, good job. How about law school to sue the people going to med school and grad school once they get out? No lawyers. Nursing school? Anything that I'm not thinking about? What's that? Pharmacy, Pharmacy school, okay, so you're, you're in the same boat. The lawyers that aren't here today, they're probably listening on the lecture, uh, you know, on YouTube. We'll, um, will be interested in terms of how carefully you think about these things. Because, you, th you know, one of the issues is if you induce this immune suppression, let's say you're blocking T cell activation because somebody's got a transplant that they, you don't want to have it get rejected, obviously the issue is that that person is now immunosuppressed and they're going to be very susceptible to infection, right? So, as well as, as the development of tumors. So, you have your work cut out for you. And that's really where I think the, the effort is right now, trying to understand all this kind of gory signal transduction is, it turns out to be very important because if the more we understand about how this all works, the better we can tailor the sort of, of drugs uh, to try to block specific responses and not just in general block a T cell response. Any questions about this? Yeah. Uh, what activates FIN again? What activates FIN? So, so LCK and FIN, are both associated with uh, CD4. And so the, the consequence of that is that when CD4, or, or in a CTL, you'd have CD8, either way. Uh, that, that then results in early activation of LCK and FIN. And so then, as a consequence of that, you get this, uh, some of these ITAMs plus four related that can result in recruitment of ZAP70 and activation of ZAP70. Any other questions? Yeah. Say again, sorry. Which one phosphorylates the ITAM? Which one phosphorylates the ITAM? These LCK, sorry, LCK and FIN early on can do so, and then ZAP70 can do so later. Any other questions? All right. So now, one of the consequences of when a T cell gets activated, you know, I mentioned all of these different signaling pathways that are involved in that process, as well as the fact that there's this global uh, there's this change in global transcription inside that cell. And one of the targets of that change is a cytokine called interleukin-2 or IL-2. And we know that IL-2 is really important for T cells because if you knock it out, you have you know, a, a reduced number of T cells and you have defective T cell responses in vivo. But on top of that, um, you know, we, we know that one of the responses to activation is, is the production of, of IL-2, and then IL-2 can actually feed back through an autocrine signaling pathway onto that cell, and there, there are IL-2 receptors that are present on the surface of a T cell that then allow it to undergo uh, clonal expansion. So it can then go into cell cycle, start to make lots of copies of itself, all of which are antigen-specific, 
And then those cells can then go out and do their job as effector cells. So what, what happens with T cells is that, you, you know, obviously in response to stimulation, you start to get upregulation of IL-2 expression. It's being secreted by the cell. Um, and then the consequent, and then on top of that, this T cell starts to move into the G1 phase of cell cycle. So if any of you guys have taken cell biology, you know that there's these different stages in cell cycle. G1 uh, is a stage that's just after G0. So these T cells are essentially in their resting naive state are in G0 and, and they need to get into active cell cycle. In order to do so, one signal comes through the T cell receptor itself, as we've described, that leads to those cells transitioning into the G1 stage. But as you know from cell biology, you need to actually get into S phase in order to, to complete the process of cell cycle. So um, they're not quite there yet. They're sort of stuck and they're waiting for a signal from IL-2. And so here the cell is secreting IL-2 and then it comes along and binds to an IL-2 receptor that's present on the surface of this cell and that then results in um, some, some things going on in the cell. But one of the things that I wanted to note in particular about the IL-2 receptor is that there are, uh, there are three chains and we'll come back to cytokine signaling in a bit about how this works, but I really wanted to point out that there are three chains of the mature IL-2 receptor that are necessary for high affinity binding. So IL-2 is the cytokine, it comes along and binds to this receptor which is made up of a alpha, beta, and gamma chains. And this alpha chain is not present on naive T cells, so they don't do a very good job of binding to IL-2. But once they become activated, they start to upregulate this alpha chain. And so the consequence then is you get this high affinity binding and that then can drive the cell um, into cell cycle. So they then go past the restriction point, they start to proliferate, and they start to expand. And then at that point, they can then differentiate into these different effector cell types. Now, another issue, we've talked quite a bit about tolerance, and, and we'll talk more about it later in the course. But you know, when we think about T cell activation, the last time I, I mentioned this idea that in order for T cells to become productively activated in their naive state, not only do they need to get the signal through the, IL the, the T cell receptor, but they also need to get a co-stimulatory signal. And I mentioned that that's dependent on um, an antigen presenting cell that has seen some sort of molecular patterns, whether it's associated with microbial infection or it might be associated with tissue damage. The result is that you need to have a mature antigen presenting cell in order to activate that T cell. And so to do so, so what, what happens to that, this antigen presenting cell is that it upregulates a ligand that we call a costimulatory ligand on its surface called B7. Okay, so, so the productive activation of a T cell requires not just signal one, which is coming through MHC peptide binding to the T cell receptor, but it also needs to have this costimulatory receptor, which is called CD28, binding to B7 on the surface of this mature antigen presenting cell. So if you get both of those signals, that's considered productive activation and you have an activated T cell. Now if you get just the uh, signal one alone, if you just get the signal coming through the T cell receptor and there's no B7 on the surface of this antigen presenting cell because it's immature, it hasn't seen any sort of uh, damage or, or microbial pathogen, the result of that is that you, you get signal one but you don't get signal two. So you need to have that signal coming through CD28. If you don't have it, the cell doesn't just get activated. So it doesn't just not get activated, but on top of that it becomes what we call energic. And so when we say energic, what we mean is that the cell is, is not becoming activated, so it's not going to undergo um, uh, cell division and, and differentiation. But on top of that, it's actively energic, meaning that any subsequent attempt to activate that T cell is going to fail. So the cell becomes energic and oftentimes it will die off. And the purpose of that is to ensure that there's tolerance, that the, you know, that the T cell is getting activated in the, in the context of some sort of damage or, or microbial infection somewhere. So the absence of that signal will um, suppress any subsequent activation. Now if the, the cell gets a signal simply through the co-stimulatory receptor but there's no antigen there that its T cell can recognize, the result is that it just gets signal two and this really doesn't do anything to the cell. It doesn't have any significant change in gene expression. It's a question. So B7 is upregulated. So the question is, where, where is B7 expressed? Is it only expressed with viral or bacterial infection? So it's expressed as a consequence of a dendritic cell or a B cell or macrophage getting a signal from the innate immune system. Essentially, uh, 
binding to you know LPS from bacteria, it could be from you know fungal uh, or or viral signals that are what we consider these PAMPs, pathogen associated molecular patterns, or they could also be what we call DAMPs, which are danger associated molecular patterns. Basically, if they see something bad going on, they 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 don't know what it is that's bad. They just know that it's bad, so they they then upregulate. B7 on the surface, traverse to the, um, the nearest lymph node, and then they can present that to a, to a naive T cell. Any other questions? Right. So the consequence of this recognition by a T cell of an antigen presenting cell expressing the appropriate antigen that, that gives rise to this interaction with the T cell receptor, as well as its costimulatory receptor, CD28, binding to the costimulatory ligand, B7, is that you get productive activation of this T cell, this naive T cell. Then it starts to proliferate using the signals that we talked about, and it's producing IL-2 that drives that proliferation. And as a consequence of that, then it starts to differentiate. So, and I'll show you some examples of the differentiation that will take place uh, in a minute. And then finally, it becomes what we call an effector cell, meaning that it, it takes on the genic transcription profile that it needs in order to become a particular type of helper cell or a cytotoxic T cell or what have you. And it, it needs to do that because it's you know, no longer in this process of, of prolifera pro prolifera proliferation, uh, but it needs to now bear this effector function, be able to get rid of whatever the problem is, whether it's an infection or, or some sort of uh, tumor cell or what have you. So let's talk about some of the different types of effector cells that are generated. So, so here we have a naive T cell, and for, for helper cells, these CD4 positive cells, there are several different um, effector types or, or dif differentiation stages that these cells can undergo. And it really depends on the cytokine environment, the, the local cytokine expression within the lymph node where that T cell gets activated. That's gonna dictate whether the cell becomes one of these different helper subtypes. So some examples of these, and there's, there's quite a few now, but we'll just focus on three types. So one are these uh, Treg cells, and we've encountered these before. When we were talking about negative selection, I, I mentioned that you know, a lot of the cells will die apoptotically if they recognize self. But I also mentioned that some cells within the medulla, when they, get, when they recognize self, they differentiate into what we call regulatory T cells or Tregs. We call those natural Tregs because those are being generated within the thymus to, to be naturally specific for self. But you can also take a, a naive T cell that's gone through thymic uh, differentiation and is at that point simply a naive cell. It doesn't ha ha hasn't made any sort of choice about what it's gonna be. And it can become activated to become what we call an induced Treg. So it is induced in the context of the lymph node if there's a lot of uh, TGF beta around. So that TGF beta which is a cytokine and binds to these, these naive T cells, will then cause that cell to upregulate this transcription factor called FOXP3 that really dictates that this cell is gonna become a regulatory T cell, okay? And, and the significance of that is that these regulatory T cells can then induce this sort of peripheral tolerance and prevent any, any kind of a, an autoimmune or autoinflammatory response. Now, if the T cell within the lymph node is, is subject to, um, an environment where there's a lot of interleukin-12 or interferon gamma, the result is then it upregulates this transcription factor called TBET, and the cell then becomes what we call a Th1 cell. And that Th1 cell, uh, as I'll show you, it has certain uh, role in, in the body. For example, it's involved in um, activation of macrophages, has some role in B cell activation, uh, opsonization, et cetera. It's really involved in, in cell-mediated immunity. So it tends to help uh, NK cells and cytotoxic T cells do their job. So these helper cells, when we think about them, you guys have heard about them in, in the context of B cells, which is the role of these Th2 cells, but they also help other cellular um, immunity as well. Okay, now the Th2 cells develop when they become activated in, in the lymph node in the context of a lot of inter interleukin-4. That results in the upregulation as these cells are differentiating of this transcription factor called GATA3, and then the consequence is that you then generate these Th2 cells, which produce lots of unique cytokines. In this case, instead of doing, uh, making a lot of IL-2 and interferon gamma, they make IL-4 and IL-5. And these tend to be involved more in helping B cells uh, 
and promoting humoral immunity. All right, so basically, when we think about these different effector functions, what we're talking about is you know, how these T cells are differentiating, how they then uh, become specific subsets, and how that can then promote them to, um, uh, to carry out specific functions. So why, why does a T cell want to do that? What's the purpose of having all these different helper subsets? Well, you know, we, we talked about the regulatory cells. That would be a situation where the cytokine environment may say, look, we, we, we don't want to generate a, a big T cell response here because you know, there might be some inflammation going on that's not being resolved or something like that, or there's an immune response against self. Um, and then, of course, we talked about Th1 cells, which are involved primarily in controlling the, the, humor, or the uh, cellular response, Th2 cells that are involved more in controlling the B cell response and helping to make high affinity antibodies. So there's, you know, these different subsets. And this is all being uh, a result of this secretion of these specific cytokines. And in, in most cases, when we think about cytokine secretion, we're thinking about, you know, just releasing cytokines and they just kind of flow throughout the body and, and do their job. But that really doesn't work that way. In a sense, it's really sort of the local concentration of these cytokines that will dictate how these, these cells are going to respond. And, in, and part of what controls that is the fact that some of the cytokines are, are bound to the membrane. And the significance is that if it's bound to the membrane of a cell, it can have local contact with, with other cells, and the result is that you then concentrate that signal. So you don't generate essentially a, a nonspecific response just by expressing a lot of this, this cytokine all over the place. So by, by concentrating it so that you don't have just free diffusion of these cytokines, you can generate a, a very specific type of differentiation. You're not causing all the cells in that lymph, lymph node to start to differentiate into, say, a Th1 cell. Instead, you're, you're telling this antigen-specific T cell to differentiate along a particular axis. Now, that, that brings up the, the, the point that, you know, in addition to having cytokine secretion and, as well as cytokines that might be membrane-bound, we can also think of the fact that, that cytokines often function in either an autocrine or a paracrine fashion. So I don't know if you guys have heard this term before. I, I mentioned that IL-2 is produced by a T cell and then comes back and binds to a T cell or to an IL-2 receptor on the surface of that T cell. That is something that we would call um, autocrine signaling, where the cytokine that's, that's is actually produced by the cell, that cytokine is also acting on that same cell. And that's a little different from what we call paracrine signaling, and that's where cytokine produced by one cell might, might act on another cell, say, in the nearby environment. So how do these cytokines actually signal? What's actually happening within the cell um, to control the, the behavior of that cell and to control its differentiation? So just as with the IL-2 receptor, as I showed you before, a cytokine can come along and it binds to the receptor um, and in this case here, we have a cytokine receptor that's made up of, of two chains, and these are unique chains. But when they're not bound to the cytokine, they're, you can see that they're not dimerized. But the cytokine comes along, it causes this receptor to become heterodimerized, and then that sends a signal within this, the cell to change uh, gene transcription. So how does that work? Well, associated with these receptor chains are what are called Janus kinases, that are, are tyrosine kinases, um, that can, just as with T cell receptor signaling, they can phosphorylate um, on tyrosines in some of these um, intracellular proteins. So here we have a cytokine binding that causes dimerization. That causes these tyrosine kinases, these Janus kinases or JAKs, to become activated. And then they start to, to phosphorylate the, um, the cytokine receptor uh, cytoplasmic tails. And so the consequence of this is that once the cytokine receptors are phosphorylated on tyrosines, that allows transcription factors called STATs to come along and bind to these um, tyrosine phosphorylated cytokine receptor tails. And so the result is that once they, they're in this, this um, proximity, they're nearby these, these JAK kinases, and then the JAKs themselves can phosphorylate the STATs. So the stats come along, they bind to the tyrosine phosphorylated cytokine tail, cytokine receptor tails, they then become phosphorylated by the JAKs, and once the JAKs do their, their business, then these stats actually prefer, there's a higher affinity binding for um, another tyrosine phosphorylated stat, so they leave the receptor, 
And of course, you know, for a tyrosine, for a uh, transcription factor to work, it needs to make its way into the nucleus. And so when they're in this non-phosphorylated, non-dimerized form, they basically float around inside of the cytosol. But once they're phosphorylated, they heterodimerize, and then they can make their way into the nucleus where they can then induce gene transcription and change the outcome of, of um, activation. So they can, and there are, as I mentioned, these cytokines are really important for the differenti di differentiation of these T cells. And this is the process that's taking place inside those cells. So any questions about cytokine signaling? Okay. So as I mentioned, there's distinct um, cytokines that are not only involved in the generation of these different helper subsets, but are also involved in their, um, their effector function. And that's also true for, for CD8 cells. So here you have a cytotoxic T cell. Um, and some of the, the um, uh, cytokines that are associated with these cytotoxic cells are interferon gamma and something called LT or lymphotoxin. But these guys, as we'll learn, they also produce a, a variety of what are called cytotoxins. These are proteins that are involved in the, the ability of a CTL to kill its uh, target cell. So in this case, you have a virally infected cell. It's producing viral peptides, which can then activate this cytotoxic T cell. And as a consequence, then it's going to kill that cell. And I'll show you some examples of that in a minute. Th1 cells, which are involved in, in promoting a cellular response, um, in this case here, they're, they're helping a macrophage uh, get rid of intracellular um, bacteria. And the, the cytokines that are associated with that are interferon gamma, GMCSF, TNF-alpha, lymphotoxin, and IL-3. Whereas these Th2 cells, which are primarily involved in helping B cells, are producing cytokines like uh, IL-4, 5, 10, 13, and, and TGF-beta. Now, why is this important? You know, I said that they, they have these distinct cytokines and, and those cytokines are associated with certain types of, of responses. And I also mentioned that, you know, that the T cell really needs to be activated in such a way that it, it can deal with a particular type of insult, whether it's a bacterial infection or a, you know, a tumor or what have you. But a good example of this is with leprosy. So leprosy is caused by something called uh, mycobacterium leprae. And in this case, the response to this bacterium is very important. So if you have a Th1 response, so if you have a bunch of T cells that are um, activated and uh, can, can basically produce these Th1 associated cytokines, the result is that you have a certain type of outcome. So there are different forms of, of leprosy. There's one that's called tuberculoid, which is a little bit less invasive, um, and it, it primarily causes some problems with uh, lung epithelia. And so in this case here, you can see that there's um, a lot of Th1 cytokines that are associated with this tuberculoid um, type of leprosy, whereas this lepromatous leprosy, you really don't see a lot of these Th1 cytokines being produced in these lesions. All right, so that suggests that, you know, in, in this tuberculoid form, you primarily generate a Th1 response. If you look in uh, Th2 cytokines, IL-4, 5, and 10, what you find is that those are mostly associated with this lepromatous or more serious form uh, of leprosy. And so, uh, so what do you guys think? Which one, which kind of response, you know, if you say ended up in, um, you know, one of these small Hawaiian islands where they had this leper colony and your T cells are, are being brought in to try to control any sort of response, what, what would you rather have, a Th1 or Th2 type of response? I mean, they're both kind of bad, right? You don't want to get leprosy, but if you're going to ch choose between the two, you know, this lepromatis, I don't want to get into the details because it's lunchtime, but um, it's, it's kind of a nasty thing. So you obviously want to generate a Th1 response because a Th1 response is much better at clearing this particular uh, microbe. Okay, so if you generate a Th2 response, you might be able to help out some B cells and generate some antibodies, but it's pretty clear from this that um, you, know, you really want to generate a Th1 response, and that kind of restricts the, the infection so that you don't generate one of these more um, nasty kind of infections. Okay, so that's just one example. There's a lot of examples of where you know, the immune system, if it makes the wrong choice, that can then result in some sort of pathology that's associated with the disease. So let's talk about cytotoxic T cells. Um, 
So you, you guys know that these cytotoxic T cells, they express on their surface CD8, and they recognize MHC class one with peptide that's, that's presented. And so the consequence of that recognition is that, and, and again, these are not naive T cells at this state. They're now effector cells, so they've upregulated all of these proteins that are associated with, with killing cells. Um, so the result of that then is that when they bind to this uh, MHC class one, they really don't need to have any sort of co-stimulation at this point. They've already become activated. They can bind to any cell that has, um, say, a viral peptide or what have you on the surface. The consequence of that is that you get these changes within the cell in the, um, the secretory pathway. So you know, you guys, those of you who've taken cell bio or high school biology or whatever would know that you know, when you produce secreted proteins, those go from the ER through the Golgi, through the secretory ves vesicles, and then finally make their way with the membrane and then are released. So there's a variety of these cytotoxin molecules that as a consequence of this interaction, you have this reorientation of that secretory pathway towards the interface that exists between these two cells. And if you zoom in on this, you can see here these specialized vesicles um, that we call uh, uh, cytotoxic granules. And those cytotoxic granules can then release vectorally these cytotoxins onto this target cell. So the target cell is the cell that's infected with a virus. And the consequence of that then is that the cell will then commit, commit suicide. And if you look at this uh, microscopically, you can see that sort of a change in the overall um, the organellular pattern in these cells where you can see that there's a lot of these, these granules, cytotoxic granules, moving their way towards the interface between the T cell and this target cell. Now the other thing about this is if you think about, you know, a T cell has to catch up with a virus infection. So let's say that, you know, you, you, you go home on Thanksgiving and enjoy some nice turkey and, you know, your, your brother has three kids that are, you know, in uh, daycare. Okay, so daycare is sort of a breeding ground for all sorts. I mean, it's a great place. My kids went to it, but, you know, they, they always come home infected. And every time, you know, we do fine, but then we meet up with the cousins, and then all of a sudden everybody gets sick. So that, you know, an example of that is uh, you get infected. Now you have to have a T cell response in order to be able to deal with that infection. So let's say you got, you know, one of these kids has flu. Your immune system needs to get activated to respond to that flu to try to reject it. And you know, if you didn't get your, your flu shot that, that year, whatever, you need to generate this, this response. So the first few days, you start to feel sick and you're kind of regretting meeting up with the, the relatives for Thanksgiving. But what's happening is your T cells are trying to catch up. You've already got a lot of infection within the lung with this flu bug. And now those T cells need to be able to catch up and, and respond to that. So of course, you need a bunch of CD8 cells to kill off the, the lung cells that have the virus in order to be able to control the virus. So you need to have a lot of these guys. So how does the immune system deal with that? Well, one thing is the T cells start to divide really, really fast. They, they differentiate into CTLs, and then they can start to kill off these cells. But on top of that, the CTLs are, they don't just go along and then kill one cell. They can uh, kill multiple cells. So here you can see CTL that's come along. It's killed off this one cell that's infected with virus. And the reason why it wants to do that is because the virus needs the host proteins. It needs the, ho the, the replication system inside of this host cell in order to continue its, prop, you know, its ability to replicate. And if you kill that cell, that virus, it's a dead end for it. So it can't, it can't continue along. So then the, the CTL comes along to the next cell, kills that, and, and so forth. And these CTLs can go along, bouncing from one infected cell to the next, and be able to kill multiple cells. So the immune system, you know, the, especially the CD8 response, it, it expands very rapidly, but even, uh, you know, every CTL has the ability to kill, to kill multiple uh, target cells. And we call that process serial killing, believe it or not. So immunologists have a sense of humor sometimes too. May not come out, but um, anyways. So what are they doing to these cells? So, they induce a process in the cell called apoptosis. I mean, how many of you guys have heard that? We, I, I've mentioned it before in the context of, of negative selection, but if you've had cell biology or done a little bit of, of outside reading, you've probably heard of this, what's called apoptosis, which is a programmed form of cell death. And basically, uh, this is a EM micrograph of a health, healthy cell, and you can see, uh, you know, generally speaking, it looks, it looks pretty happy. But then once the cell becomes apoptotic, the consequence of that is 
is that it starts to generate these little um, membrane vesicles, which ultimately bud off of, of this cell and become uh, what are called apoptotic bodies. And the purpose of that is essentially to cause the cell to die and to do so in a way that um, uh, uses the machinery within that cell to induce its own death. Okay, so if you, if you look further, you can see here's a, a cell that's starting to break down. You actually have, you know, it, it, as part of this process of death, it starts to break down its chromatin. So you no longer can propagate that cell. It can't divide anymore. It, it basically kills itself off. And that's what these CTLs are doing. They come in, they induce apoptosis in these cells, and that's different from another form of death that's called necrotic cell death, which is uh, primarily a non-programmed form of death that is induced as a consequence of, of damage. It's typically, you know, like if you starve a cell of energy, the cell can't maintain osmotic regulation, and then it just sort of explodes. All right, so this is an example of, of um, you know, if you follow this over time, these CTLs are killing quite quickly. It's about 30 minutes, somewhere between 15 to 30 minutes for a CTL to just be bound to its target cell, um, at which point you can actually start to see uh, evidence for apoptosis in that cell. So it's very quick, and that's allowing these CTLs to go along and induce apoptosis. And I really quickly want to show um, what this looks like. So here you have a, a T cell that's coming along. It's bound to this target cell that's perhaps infected with a virus or something like that. And as we follow this with time, you start to see changes taking place inside of this cell. So now you can start to see these little bubbles. Those are what, what I was calling these apoptotic bodies. And the, the consequence of, of that is that these apoptotic cells can then be engulfed by a nearby um, macrophage or other phagocytic cell. There's Bill Nye. All right, and then one other. The green cell you see here is a killer T cell of the immune system which is attacking the cancerous red and blue cell. You can tell that the killer cell has recognized the cancer cell because the two dots move around and contact the target. The killer cell then spreads out over the cancerous cell. Passing the video through a filter makes the killer cell look yellow and allows us to really see how it focuses on the cancer cell. These killer T cells are constantly hunting down dangerous cells throughout the body and destroying them. So how are these guys actually doing this? What are they, what's the, the mechanism that they use? Well, there's actually two different mechanisms that they can use to kill. One of which is they can release lytic granules. So I was talking about these cytotoxic granules that kind of make their way towards that interface between the target cell and the T cell. And inside of those granules are a bunch of, of uh, proteins that uh, some of these are called granzymes and these are proteases that can induce apoptosis. But the issue is that the the uh, granzymes need to make their way inside of the cytosol of this, um, this target cell. And in order to do so, the T cell also has something called perforin, which basically pokes these holes in the membrane of the target cell. So by poking these holes, uh, this allows these, these uh, granzymes to be able to come inside of the cell and induce um, apoptosis inside the cell. There's also another molecule called uh, granulysin that basically helps perforin to set up these, these little pores and allow these, these uh, granzymes to enter into the, um, into the T cell. So that's one pathway, and we would call that sort of the, the perforin or a cytolysin pathway. The second pathway involves something called FAS and FAS ligand. And these are sort of uh, FAS ligand and FAS, we can think of these as, as receptor ligand pair, and they're basically molecular switches of death. So if the cell gets a signal from another cell that binds to its, fast, to its fast receptor, that then directly will induce the apoptosis. And so we know that there are at least two of these different pathways that are, that are involved in CTL uh, killing. And I know this because I made perforin knockout mice. When I was a graduate student, I generated mice that had a deficiency, a genetic defect in the perforin gene, and those mice 
um, they still had this fast-induced apoptosis, and you could still see some killing of some of these cells, but they had some pretty you know, significant defects in being able to fight off things like viral infections because they, did, they didn't have this, that, that particular cytotoxic pathway. Any questions about CTLs or CTL killing? All right. So what about the, the helper cells? So here we have a Th1 cell, which as I mentioned, um, they, they produce interferon gamma, and they also produce on their surface another molecule, which is called CD40 um, ligand. And so here you have a Th1 cell, as I mentioned, these, these guys are really good at promoting cellular responses, and in this case, they can also activate macrophages to um, become mic microbicidal. So let's say you have a macrophage here that's infected with some sort of intracellular uh, bacterium, and these bacteria like to go into these, these little vesicles that they generate for themselves and kind of try to hide out from the immune system in this context. But of course, you know, some of these peptides from this, these bacteria are gonna make their way into the class one path, the class two pathway. That's gonna then lead to the activation of some of these Th1 cells that then, then come along, become activated, and express uh, CD40 ligand on the surface. And that binds to CD40, a receptor on this macrophage that provides one signal. They're also, these Th1 cells are producing interferon gamma, which binds to an inter interferon gamma receptor on this macrophage. And the combination of the two then results in uh, killing of these intracellular bacteria. So, how does that all work? So I mentioned this interferon gamma and CD40, and this then will activate these macrophages to destroy these engulfed bacteria. They, they produce a lot of uh, factors inside the cell that can make their way into these endocytic vesicles or, or um, bacterial vesicles and kill off those bacteria. Also, um, Th1 cells can upregulate fast ligand and lymphotoxin, and, and by binding to these, the result is that you can kill off some of these bacteria, um, or kill off the, uh, the macrophage itself, and then the bacteria can be engulfed by other macrophages. And so the consequence then is that you can um, not only get rid of the, the source of, of the infection, the bacteria, but you also get rid of the, the host, in this case, these, mic these macrophages. IL-2 can be produced, and the result of that is that you get increased proliferation and generation of more of these Th1 cells. Um, another example of this is with IL-3 and GMCSF, which can then basically make their way into the bone marrow and induce more differentiation of these mac macrophages from um, hematopoietic stem cells. Tumor necrosis factor plus lymphotoxin can promote the recruitment of these macrophages into the, the site of infection. So basically by secretion of this within the tissue, you can have this process of extravasation and diapedesis uh, to get these macrophages into the right place so that they can get rid of this, um, this stuff. And then CXCL2 is a chemokine. We've talked about these guys before, that they can induce chemotaxis. And this also serves as a signal to uh, recruit these macrophages towards the site of the infection. Now, if for some reason these Th1 cells don't seem to be able to control the infection, uh, what can ultimately happen is oh, what are called granulomas, and these are basically a, a group of these infected macrophages that sort of ball up, and they're kind of walled behind um, a whole bunch of T cells that are trying um, to get rid of these infections. But the consequence of, of not being able to do so um, can lead to something that's called caseous necrosis, and so this can cause significant damage within the tissue. And again, you know, we've talked before about some of these signals that dampen a T cell response. Why this is so important is because if, if the T cells do not respond appropriately and you develop a chronic infection, the consequence of that is that you can have a lot of local uh, tissue pathology. So you can get a lot of tissue damage if the immune system doesn't um, seem to resolve this appropriately. So the last thing I want to talk about just in the last minute is these T cells and how they make these interactions with, with B cells. And I, I don't want to go through this in significant detail because you guys have already heard about this from Dr. Fruman. Only to point out that you know, Th2 cells, which are primarily involved in, in the humoral response, their interaction is primarily going to be occurring with these B cells. And they secrete unique cytokines that, that have a function uh, on these B cells. So as you know, B cells, when they interact with these T cells, the result is that you can generate certain isotypes of, of antibody, 
So the immunoglobulin, you might need perhaps an IgG 2A or something for a particular response. And so you have these cytokines produced by these Th2 cells that then allow that B cell to undergo class switching and then make the appropriate immunoglobulin. Uh, but on top of that, you know, the, the T cell is also providing help signals that allow these B cells to differentiate into plasma cells. Um, and those are coming through molecules like CD40 ligand expressed on the surface of the cell binding to CD40 on the B cell. Okay. And I'm going to skip this now because we'll come back when we talk about vaccines and this point about, you know, this interaction between a T cell and a B cell that promotes um, uh, a response against, that's part of these conjugate vaccines. All right, so we'll see you guys on Friday.